All right, we're uh, we're waiting for a few more people to come on in, but uh, yeah, as it says, say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're coming from um, or watching from, and um, <clears throat> then I'll introduce Anne, and we'll make sure this technology is working. Can can people hear me now? If uh, just give me one person to say you can hear me or not. Thanks, Trisha. Yes. All right. Good. Yeah, we get a little bit of a delay on on uh, these comments here, so they come in in about five seconds or so. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All right. Good. So we've got audio. Um, I guess what we're going to do is uh, we're going to try this screen here just to show you who's involved in this. So this is Ann Garvin. I'm Tim Storm. Um, glad people can hear us. Uh, Ann, speak up and let's uh, see if they can hear you. Okay, can you hear me, everyone? Hi. Oh, it's so fun to see everybody from different places. Mississippi, Minneapolis, Iowa. Oh, New Glarus. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> Hi, Krista. Herman's here, I guess. Peanut's here in case, but he's exhausted. It's exhausting staying at home. Exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting staying at home. Yeah, especially depending on who you're sharing the house with. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, so we've got we've got the audio going. We're, it looks like we're uh, we're good to go. So um, <clears throat> so I wanted to, I guess, first of all, start off just by saying that um, the idea here was to talk to Anne. Um, and let me know, by the way, in the comments, if you're getting an echo or anything, I can put my headphones in. But um, the the idea here was to um, talk to Anne just about her process uh, that I was really interested in hearing about. Um, and I, I wanted to start just by saying that this is um, not prescriptive. This is descriptive. We're describing something that a writer did and met with success with. And uh, and that's that. And, you know, it may you may have some good takeaways for you. There may be some things here that you can um, use as inspiration for the next story you're going to come up with. Um, but this is also, we're not saying that this is your step to a bestseller or any of that nonsense that you sometimes see with, <laughs> uh, with yeah, with classes um, saying, you know, 10 steps to a bestseller. Um, <clears throat> so we're saying this is a good process uh, that kind of meets, meets in the middle between writing the book you want to write and writing a book that uh, will sell and that people will want to read. Um, so keeping that in mind that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. And um, and then the other thing is I just wanted to give a little bit of background on this and talk about how um, I, I met with Anne, this was probably like two years ago or so, we met in this coffee shop. And Anne at that time was um, telling me about a novel she had written um, it was finished. She was working on some uh, subsequent edits of it, and um, and you can elaborate on this a little, Anne. But the your agent just wasn't wasn't into it. Nope. I actually I had I was working on that book then. I think I was simultaneously working on another one that um, that I could not get anybody interested in, and. Um, you know, for whatever reason, the market reasons, um, or, and I learned a lot about myself during that writing process, but yeah, Tim knows, and we talked a great deal about it. We were preparing for a conference. Right, right. And so, and that's, you know, that's a story that's not um, that unique to writers who have published books is that they write another one and it's not doing that well and it's not gaining traction. Um, and they can't sell it to an agent, you know? So I think a lot of writers and especially seasoned writers that have some a book published, um, you know, you don't find necessarily that it gets easier with every book. Um, you know some things about it and there's some aspects that get easier, but it's not like once you're in, you're in, right? Yeah, that's what people always say. They're like, well, you're already published and you have a leg up. and. I mean, there's a, we can talk about that another time because that's not always the case. But in fact, I didn't have an agent when I was working on these two books at the time. 
And I did get an agent with these two books, but they were more like, we like your writing. We want something from you, just not these two things. Right. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> that, yeah. So um, it's like good news, bad news. Like, oh, we love you. Not this, though. Something else. <laughs> We sort of like you, but like you, if you did something else entirely, then we would love you. <laughs> so, you know, not unlike a love life. <laughs> right. So your next <laughs> step was at somewhere soon after that, you came up with these five treatments and yeah. you, I don't know how soon after that it was, but you came up with five treatments that you sent to an agent and you basically said, pick one, right? That's exactly what I did. After I wrote those two books, I thought, I'm not doing that again. You know, that fooled me once. Shame. Well, then, so I had had over the years lots of ideas. Like, I have a notebook with lots of ideas um, for books and things like that. And so, also, I have um, spent a lot of time in New York work, working with authors on how to pitch their books and how to do pitch conferences and how to write uh, those trail paragraphs things like that. And so because I studied story and because I studied that so much, I thought I am going to write a bunch of pitches for books that I think are squarely in my wheelhouse and something that could be definitely marketed um, widely. And none of them were necessarily, you know, they weren't experimental, but they were definitely in my brand and definitely in my voice. And I, I worked, you know, honestly, I remember working on those feverishly for about two weeks, three weeks, revising, writing, revising, writing. And then when I was done, I sent them to my agent and I said, pick one um, or at least number them. And I will work on them in the order that you want me to work on them. And she did. That's nice. exactly what happened. So she basically get, ranked them for you. She did. She ranked them for me. And she said, this is the one that I think I can sell right now. This is the one I think that has the, the legs to it. Um, and then, I mean, then I, it was kind of this fantastic thing because then I, I really worked out um, using classic story structure, what the rest of the book was going to be generally. And then I wrote the first um, 25 pages and she sold the novel on that. So I have the experience of writing two full novels, paying to have them edited, having them completed and passed on. And now I have the experience of selling one on an outline on 25 pages. So, and the reason I say that in the sort of sentence like that is that when I come out and I say that about having written it in 25 pages and selling it on an outline, that's when people chime in and go, well, you had an agent, it was easy for you, blah, blah, blah. But I want to remind them that I have two 300 page books in a drawer that I hope eventually will get sold, but I don't know if they will. And so that the end story of those 25 pages getting sold is the end of a larger story of writing two books before that, that didn't make it. And then, you know, three books before that, that were published. So um, I, I just feel like you have to know the whole story. Otherwise, it's too easy to either discard um, what we're suggesting or it's either too easy to adopt it and expect the same results. Right. Does that makes right. sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, people are saying that your video is hiccuping them a little bit, which oh. I see too, but I think your video or your audio is fine. So are you guys hearing her well? Um, and I'm not sure, you know, at some point, who knows where the technology oh, is. Oh, I do see that. Yeah, yeah. like a little blink. Yeah. So I don't know if that's my my house's internet or yours or what's oh, going okay. on. But, yep, I see that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. There's also a decent chance. I'm in a different room than I was the last time I did a live stream where I th thought there was a 50-50 chance that a child would run behind me. <laughs> so I think I've reduced that chance. But... I am a little farther from Wi-Fi, so it's it's maybe that sacrifice. And I think there's probably a 75% chance that you're going to hear a dog or a kid screaming in the background at some point. So <clears throat> just keep that in mind. Yeah, um, we're still we're still in, in Amateurville here with uh, with the the broadcasting to yeah. YouTube. But but again, um, 
fitting fitting with the times. Good. Audio is fine. Good to know. All right. I, um, I can comment. I think it's funny that I can't say, look at Tim's hair and comment. <laughs> <laughs> you can't comment? Yeah. Yeah, I can't comment. <laughs> I can hold up a little sign that says, you know. <laughs> um, all right. So these treatments, what what goes in when you sent those five to your agent? Yeah. Those included like a short synopsis, like two or three paragraphs. Yep. Um, and then kind of like a a, a, a dangling log line, like a mm -hmm. sort of a marketing log line. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, like uh, your comps, right? Yes. Um, what, uh, if people don't know what that is, it's, um, you know, you name like two titles that it's similar to, right? Or a mix of. And um, and then you also had in your treatment, eventually, I don't know if you sent this right away, but that's my question is, you had a longer outline that was about 2000 words mm -hmm. where synopsis that kind of broke it down structurally. Yeah. So when you sent those five synopses, did it include all four of those elements with all no. five of those? No, uh, it did not. I, but I did try to write. So a couple of things, and some of the things that I would like to teach people how to do is one: I'd like to teach people how to build out a story in the way that we're suggesting, and then two: I'd like to teach people how to write the pitch of that story in the way that captures the agent and makes their job really easy to sell it. So I believe that one of the reasons that my agent was able to take that information and go straight to an editor with it was because um, I had given her the short synopsis that built out the story in a short way and in a pithy way that made that could easily be picked up and put right into the back cover of a book. I gave her the comps and how it should be pitched. And I also gave her a log line that told um, the sort of, um, sometimes the query part or the paragraph or the treatment or the nut graph or whatever you call it sort of buries the lead. But the log line doesn't bury the lead and you can see it right away. So that she could just take the whole thing and pitch it right away without doing too much with it. Um, I like to make my agents and editors work the very least they have to work for my work. Um, I, I don't need a lot of handholding. I don't want a lot of handholding. Um, I want a lot of information afterwards so that I can edit it in the way that they think it should be edited. But as far as going forward, I want it to be as professional as possible. I don't want them to be ever going, I kind of think she knows what she's doing or yeah, that sort of makes sense. I don't want any of that. I want people to be able to read it and go, yep, okay, we can pitch this. It's not going to take that much time. I got up 10 minutes. I'm going to send out an email. Um, and then the longer piece, um, and I've started to do that just for myself for writing the book, is I put it into um, very classic three-act story structure. Um, and I write summary paragraphs as if, those were going to be in the book or on the back of the cover. Like I write those in a snappy way that explains that I know what story is, but it doesn't build out the story so precisely that there's no exploration while I'm writing. Um, in fact, I have seen people write very detailed outlines. And if I had to do that, I would lose my energy to write the book. But I can provide a very detailed spine of my story that still allows new characters and new plot points to come in um, as I go forward. And the reason that I can do that is I know my characters. And so one of the things I should say, and Tim and I should say, is that we are planning on doing a bunch of these that helps walk you through all of these stages eventually. But today we just want to talk about, I guess I think what we want to do is sort of build our case for this being one good process that works. Right, right. Why kind of do this um, in what would normally seem to be the backwards way? Right. Like most of the fiction world, you write the book. Yeah. And then you do all this stuff of figuring out, okay, what's my synopsis? What's my yeah. pitch? <clears throat> and um, yeah, so figuring out, just explaining, laying out the argument for why you might want to try to reverse that. 
Um, and we'll talk maybe a little bit later about how, how I think even people without an agent, that still is something that you yeah, can do. And for sure. Um, so you had these five treatments. Yep. And again, I think it's important like that you come up with multiple treatments, right? Yep. That's, in, in fact, that's kind of part of the whole point is, is you don't just write your one treatment for the story, but this is in, in some ways, that's why this is kind of called your next novel, right? It's going to be what how you might approach the next thing you write. Um, but you have these five treatments and you come up with a short synopsis. And that's really the main thing for that treatment that you would um, send to the agent or that people could run by other people. Um, <clears throat> and, and if possible, kind of a log line and uh, some comps, right? Right. Yep. You're, so just to clarify then, you had, you had these five treatments that included those three things mm -hmm. and not and all of them had a log line until I write the, the log line is the last thing I write. I can never okay. write the log line first. It's a nightmare. You start with a short synopsis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and then you, the long synopsis, you didn't write for all of them. You wrote that once. Yeah, I think my agents, I, I'm pretty sure my agent said to me, this is the one I like. And then I built it out into a much longer outline. And then I wrote the 25 pages. Okay. Yep. So the five, these treatments, and, and Samantha's asking to find treatment. And really what that is, is just kind of like an overview of a story that could be. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're giving a short synopsis um, and a log line and a pitch. And actually, why don't we go ahead and show? Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so this was the treatment, um, and <clears throat> maybe slightly revised from what you sent to her. But this was the three-paragraph short synopsis that you sent to your agent, right? It is. Yep. So, um, so would you mind just reading this out loud to us, and we'll yep. we'll um... sure. Yeah, it says, um, I thought you said this would work. That's the title. And um, it says, Samantha Holton and Holly Dunphy have two things in common. It's not Samantha's unwavering confidence that conflict avoidance will lead to a happy life, nor is it Holly's take no prisoners attitude or blistering sense of humor. Nope. The only thing they have in common are that they despise each other and they love their best friend of 25 years, Katie Martin, their shared roommate in college. The trouble is, Katie Martin's cancer is back with a vengeance. Neither Samantha nor Holly can imagine a world without their friend in it, and the two frenemies would do anything to make Katie's life better, even travel across country together to save Katie's diabetic Great Pyrenees from euthanasia and bring the dog home. To succeed, they will have to steal Katie's ex-husband's Winnebago, locate the dog, brave prejudice, a violent trucker, and their own crappy history and narrow-minded thinking. But neither woman will do Katie any good if they don't confront a secret from their past that has weakened their bond, a bond that, if strengthened, could be enough to save them all. Great. So, yeah, so I like this. So this, you get something like this. And actually, I was looking at... Um, just kind of the short synopses at a lot of, um, for books like on great reads. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually, I might try to pull one of those up really quick. Um, <clears throat> so you guys can do this, but you go to great reads and you look at something, you know, you take a look at a book and right in here, these three paragraphs, mm -hmm. Linus Baker leads a quiet, solitary life. At 40, he lives in a tiny house with a devious cat and his old records. As a caseworker at the Department of Charge of Magical Youth, he spends his days overseeing the well-being of children in government sanctions orphanages. So the first really, the first paragraph is kind of introducing us to who are the characters here, right? Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what you're doing in your first paragraph. Yeah. Is introducing us to those protagonists. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is kind of like what gets the, what kicks the story off. When Linus is unexpectedly summoned by extremely upper management, he's given a curious and highly classified assignment. Travel to Mar uh, Marcius Island orphanages, Orphanage, where six dangerous children reside. A gnome, a sprite, a wyvern, an un unidentifiable green blob, a were Pomeranian, and the Antichrist. Linus must set aside his fears and determine whether or not they're likely to bring about the end of days. And then really the final paragraph 
is is it fast forwards through like the whole rest of the book. Yeah. Just give us a sense of like what are the big conflicts that stand in the way of the goal. Um, and and it doesn't, this synopsis is not really giving away the end. It's saying pretty uh cryptic about where how things happen, right? Mm -hmm. But as the children, but the children aren't the only secret the island keeps. Their caretaker is the charming and enigmatic Arthur Parnassus, who will do anything to keep his ward safe. As Arthur and Linus grow closer, long-held secrets are exposed, and Linus must make a choice, destroy a home or watch the world burn. I saw the same thing. You guys can do this. Uh, look at these short synopses on anything in Goodreads, and you're going to see one to two paragraphs that's really laying out pretty much that exact structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, and I think what you have to do is you have to give your character, you have to give them a little bit of a, you have to, you know, you sort of have to figure out what it is that character wants right away in the synopsis. You have to figure out what's in their way. Um, and you set that up in the first, actually two thirds of the, the little treatment. And then the last part is sort of the biggest surprise and the cliffhanger. So everybody thinks that you have to summarize your whole book in the treatment and you don't, you just have to do the setup. Like these are the people, these are their want, this is what they stand in the way. And oh my God, can you believe it? This is going to happen too. And you'll just have to wait to see how it ends. And that's kind of the whole treatment thing. Right. And, and so it's, you know, it's just a big come hither. Like I think that if people understand that that's what it is, that's, it's just kind of, wouldn't this be fun? Isn't this a universal um, idea? Don't you have a friend that you don't like that you would hate to be stuck in a car with? What if there was a big dog there and it was diabetic and your friend was dying and he had to get off across country? And so Tim and I were talking about, I don't know, Tim, is this going to end up jumping into something else? But what I was going to do is talk a little bit about how I built out this story from a premise and where those ideas came from. Because to me, that's the crux of the whole thing. And Tim and I do this all the time. Like we'll be sitting in a coffee shop. I'll say to Tim, Tim, I promise I'm not going to talk to you. And then I build out three ideas for books. And then I leave and he doesn't get anything done. And um, and he laughs at all my jokes. So he's like the perfect person to sit and listen to my ideas. It's like fantastic. It's good for me anyway. For Tim, poor Tim, he's like hiding in his window in case I come, Tim! <laughs> he is. But, um, but can I start talking about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. So um, one of the things... so. So here's what happened, and I, I want. So we start with a premise, right? We and and a premise is not a story, but we. But people are always asking me, where do I get my ideas? And I don't actually have fully formed ideas. I'll tell you where I got this idea from. I was sitting with um, two really good friends who aren't really friends together. I'm sort of the one that holds those two together, and we were having dinner together. And one of them said something that I knew the other one wasn't going to like. And I thought to myself, what if those two got stuck in a car together for a length of time? <laughs> it would be holy hell. And then I thought, what if they did? And then, so right then though, it, that's my whole premise. I mean, that's the whole idea. What happens when you stick two people in a car together who don't like each other? Um, and then the question is just those natural questions that you would have at any time, if someone said, my two best friends hate each other and they got stuck in the car together, your next question would be like, why are they in the car? And then you'd say, oh, they had to go pick up their friend's um, dog who and their friend has cancer. And they said, well, um, where's the dog? Oh, the dog is across country in California because her ex-husband got him in the divorce. Oh, well, why do they both have to go? Well, because one of them can't do anything medical and the dog is diabetic and the other one has a sleep disorder and can't drive for longer than an hour or two. And so I I had to naturally kind of think about if I were going to tell this story to my friends and they were going to ask me all these questions, I have to know that. And honestly, that is the way that stories get told if you're trying to tell a story to somebody because if somebody if i said so I have my two best friends who don't like it my two best friends are going to pick it up their dog oh that sounds fun yeah it'll be fun 
<laughs> that's the end of that story. So you have to make it so my two best friends who hate each other have to go pick up my dog. They're like, oh my God, they do. Why do they hate each other? Ugh, something happened in college that they still have not worked out. What is it? Do you know what it is? I don't even know what it is. See, and then we start asking questions because we start getting interested and then people start thinking to themselves, what if I got stuck in a car with my brother? Or what if I got stuck in a car with somebody else that I didn't like? And then, and and the thing that we always want to keep in mind is the premise is just something, a roadblock, something interest. It's the hook. But the story is someone moving through a premise um, and experiencing something in an emotional way and how they change. That's what the story is. It's not the plot. It's not what you do in it. I didn't have, like when I wrote this trauma premise or this treatment, I didn't have to go to myself, well, then I'll, this plot point will happen and this plot point will happen and this plot point will happen because I... I don't think about it that way. I think about it like these two women hate each other. They got to get the dog. They both serve a purpose. What is going to make their lives absolutely miserable related to who these people are? And that's the emotional journey. Because if I can make people feel something, they will pay attention to the story. You know, it's like when someone tells me about taxes, this is how I feel. 100% denial go away. And I don't care who you are. You might be talking about taxes and I'm thinking about anything but it because my emotional response is back away. But if you're talking about candy, and I'm interested in candy, I will listen to all your candy stories because I have a really positive emotional experience for it. And I also want to see how other people handle candy. I don't really care how other people handle taxes. I'd rather die than know that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is good. So Trisha's, Trisha's asking, and I think this has kind of addressed this, but do you find that composing the synopsis first was a good way to get into writing the book? A and in this case, book. yeah, in this case, because the short synopsis is the premise. It's the book. It, it yeah. lays out all the inspiration for the book. Mm -hmm. And it forces you. Here's what it does. You can't write a good treatment or whatever we're calling it, you cannot write a good pitch unless you have a good handle on storytelling. So there's no, I always say, there's no point writing the book if you don't know what the story is going to be. And you you just have to chase back how that premise is going to affect your characters and then move forward from there. So I know that people don't do it this way. I, I think I talked to... Um, um, Mary Kabuka, is that her name? Kabuka, that sounds wrong, but I think that is her name. And she doesn't do that at all. Like she is not a planner. She's a pantser all the way through. Mm -hmm. And to me, she must have magic in her brain. Um, but I know for me, uh, it has really sorted it out for me. And here's the other thing that you should know about me is that I'm not a detail planner person. So it's not like I'm the person that has all the colored coded for folders in my, you know, drawers and stuff. And I just am this person and I make this stuff. No, I am the kind of person that still can't find her spatula. So the, the thought that I have decided to do this in such an organized way speaks to the magic and the art of writing, which is to find out what the story is and then fit that magic into classic storytelling formula. Right. It almost sounds like, you know, what we're saying to people is um, figure out your whole story ahead of time and outline it and then work from there to write it and et cetera. But really it's more like you're, you're coming up with these ideas, you're fleshing them out to the point where you get excited about them and there's enough there to know, to, to like give to other people and assess whether they're excited about them too. Yep. So, you know, I wish we could, and maybe in the future we will talk about this one, Tim, but Tim and I were sitting in a book in the coffee shop really just before the virus. So what, three weeks ago now, four weeks ago. And, um, and I was telling him a story and he said something so funny. And I was like, that's going to be the title of the book. And then we were joking. And then I went home and wrote a treatment for that because we, we were joking and joking and joking and it became the book. But 
But through that joking, we were like, why would that happen? Oh, it would happen because of this. And right. And because, Two storytellers telling jokes to each other. Yeah, where everybody <laughs> else is annoyed in the coffee shop, right? <laughs> right. But we're like cracking each other up. And we're, but essentially what we're doing is, well, who would the character be that would do that? We're like, oh, he'd be like this. And then we kind of worked it out that way. Um, right. Which really, you know, if you have a good person who has a good handle on storytelling, if you have one of your writer friends, um, they can play that. They can they can be your friend and ask you story, ask you questions about your story. Mm -hmm. You just can't get annoyed. Right, right, right. You can't get annoyed and go, no, that's not the story I'm trying to tell. You have to listen to because it's really easy to get annoyed. But look at Tim; he'd be so hard to be annoyed at. <laughs> he never annoys me. Um, um. Yeah, so the three the treatments were completely different stories. And yeah, in fact, you came up with five of them, right? Mm -hmm. They were totally different. They weren't variations on the same story. They were totally different. Yeah. We're showing you one of them and not showing you the others because there's a chance, you know, that her agent will say yes to one of the others. Um, right. But um, and then and even this like the most recent one she came up with. But yeah, some just some tips really quick um, about three paragraphs, two or three paragraphs. The, the idea with the short synopsis, again, this is the, the very short synopsis, which is kind of getting you at the premise, is peak interest, give us a sense of the story. You leave out a lot, actually, right? So much. I mean, the, the majority of the book is just summarized in that last little paragraph. You know what? In fact, um, go back to that. Can yeah. Just for a second, go back to that. Because um, there's so much to leave out in there. For example, a third character is a B-list movie star that showed up within the first three chapters in my book. It just she showed up and she plays out until the very last scene, and she's not even mentioned in there. Mm -hmm. They all go to Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Utah. That's not mentioned in there. Um, you know, there's ex-husbands, there's old boyfriends, there's there's all kinds of texting, there's a daughter. None of that is in there. It's mm -hmm. just the bare bones. Right. Yeah. Sorry. So go ahead. No, yeah. So you you really are leaving out a lot. Like, yeah. and, but it's, it is establishing who's the protagonist. Yep. Yeah. What kings, what kicks things off. Yeah. What are the what, states? What's, yeah. Right. What's the protagonist after? What's the goal here? And kind of giving an overview of the conflicts that the protagonist will face mm -hmm. and, and some sense of like what's going to change as a result of these events, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's even just hinted at. I mean, again, if we kind of look at yours and go back to that, um, if they don't confront a secret from their past that has weakened their bond, right? A bond that if strengthened could be enough to save them all. So it's just hinting that the transformation is going to be a reconciliation between these two frenemies. Mm -hmm. And then it gives you a list of some things that might um, happen like this idea of a violent trucker and their own crappy histories and that and some of that is speaks to the voice of my books and some of it is gives you a little view of that you can hold up the mushy middle of your book mm -hmm. with some interesting things so and I should say that not a single word in there is an accident and I should also say you could write a completely different one and it would be right too yeah right there isn't one way to write it right yeah, so these are really bare bones sort of things, but uh, again, kind of speaking to what Trisha was asking, um, that uh, this this sort of inspires the book, right? It's a good way to get into writing the book because it helps you get that inspiration for like, okay, what now? What can I do with these characters that I kind of enjoy having invented, right? Mm -hmm. And it keeps um, me excited about it. Like I get really excited, and each time. Like I put it away, she picked a different book. I have all these, and then I even made some new new ideas after that. Um, and every time I read one, I think, oh, I wanna write that one next. Mm -hmm. So I'm waiting. Um, I'm waiting to see what they want me to write next. Yeah. Um, uh, just a follow-up question on what you were talking about with the other characters. Was the third person not mentioned because you hadn't thought of her when you wrote that short synopsis? Oh, you know what? Kim, that's such a good question because I I change my synopsis 
while I'm writing the book. So even though I've pitched it that way, often I'll go back in and just add things and change. So um, the synopsis and the treatment and all of that is a living document as the book moves forward. So it's not static, like I sometimes change it. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I did not mention her because she, even though she is super fun, she isn't the spine of the book. The story is the emotional story of Samantha, the primary character, and um, the secondary story is her best friend. It's not, or, I mean, her, the friend she's fighting with, Holly. It's not even the one that's dying of cancer. So if the story, like if you put in your head, a story is someone's emotional journey to get what they want, then that's what your book is about. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not about World War II. It's not about trout fishing. It's about the person that's trout fishing. The story of, I don't know why I thought of that. A river runs through it. It's not mm -hmm. Brad Pitt's story. It's Brad, it's his character story about, you know, what it was like and how that rescued him in his life. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I often, I, I really encourage people to start with the protagonist right away, even when they're writing it, even if there's, they're creating a world that doesn't exist or something like that, because we don't, as humans, attach to things. We attach to people and we want to see what that, how they change. Mm -hmm. and the reason we, we're looking for a life manual when we're reading fiction. And right. Nonfiction books are memoirs or nonfiction books that create that take us through how somebody got through grief or a divorce or alcoholism. They're the story of the person, how they did it. And so we're all looking for a map. And fiction is the most entertaining map. It's a really entertaining map. And it doesn't knock you over the head with advice. You, it, you absorb it as you read it. But you only do it if you are focusing on the story or on the story of the human and the story is the emotional journey, how they change. Yeah. So these, these are a couple log lines um, that, uh, that you had with this sort of initial um, treatment that you sent to your agent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if we could look at these and, and talk about these just a, a little bit mm -hmm. um, and then we'll get to the comps, but um, yeah, so if you wouldn't mind reading these to us and talking a little bit about the process of coming up to the with these. Okay, um, so the first one is desperate to comfort their best friend in the hospital. Three women's sanity is tested on a cross-country road trip with an enormous dog and a history too big for one rickety camper. And then the second one was two frenemies determined to rescue their best friend's service dog takes a cross-country road trip in a stolen rickety glamper only to discover you can't save anyone if you don't save yourself first. So I think what's interesting about those is that both of them are fine. One might, I mean, they're both sort of do the job. I'm not sure which one's better. Um, each one of them you can see has certain things in it that the other one doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have the one that we actually use. One. Yeah, um, I do have that. Um, but either way, what you have is, there it is. Uh, <clears throat> kind of down here in which three frenemies. Risk their sanity on a cross-country road trip with an enormous dog and a dilapidated camper, all in the name of mutual love for a friend in the hospital. So what you have is the person, what's in their way, and what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. so you have, you know, these three frenemies. Their stakes are their sanity. They're going to cross country road trip with some enormous dog and a wrecked up camper, and they have to do it for a friend that's dying. Mm -hmm. So it gives you, you know, and look at the language. It's super simple language. Um, right. And that's how, uh, and the other ones before did the same thing. They said, what is their job to do in the book? Who is it? What are the stakes? And, you know, if you can add a cliffhanger, um, that's a good idea, too. Right. Right. And so to, to clarify for people who have taken um, 
classes with me when I when I've talked about I've done a log line exercise that is really more of sort of a thesis statement for the whole and it's it's less of a marketing tool and more mm -hmm. of a, mm -hmm. a focus yourself tool so it's a little bit different from the log line I've talked about but these are what you you sent these two versions to your agent with the short synopsis and then with those the comps right mm -hmm. <laughs> So that that treatment, and again to clarify, because a couple people asked, but the treatment that you sent was a short synopsis of like two to three paragraphs, um, a log line or two attempts at a log line, and the pitch, which looks like <clears throat> this, the comps, right? Yep. So a friend comp. So my really good friend. Oh, I don't know if I should even say this. I'm not going to say it, but it's a good idea. Like I, I kind of stole the friend com from a friend of mine who was using it for something else. And um, she gave me permission and sent me banana bread and we're good. But um, so a friend com sold as little Miss Sunshine meets the art of racing in the rain or little Miss Sunshine meets Thelma and Louise. And so I, I always, because I write a little bit cinematically, I often choose movies um, as a way to marry it, or I'll, I'll choose a movie and a book. So you can see that I did that. So the art of the racing in the rain is about dying and dogs, except I don't want anybody to think my dog is dying. Um, and little miss sunshine is, um, one of those epic cross country road trips, which is what, and it's wacky. So it fits with the tone of what my book is. So little miss sunshine meets Thelma and Louise really was a nice fit. Um, and so I decided that, you know, that's a good way to sort of bring it forward. Also, I try very hard to have a, a good title. Like I thought you said this would work. Um, and we haven't really talked about titles, but, and definitely we can talk about titles in another um, YouTube uh, lesson because they are supposed to be a clarion call. You're supposed to read that and go, I, who's I, thought you said, who's you? What She said it would work. What work? Like, there's enough questions in that where people go, oh, and I've said that before, too. I thought you said this could work. I've said that to people. So, and it's supposed to be like an entree, like a clarion call where you go, oh, what's that about? Mm -hmm. uh, like, I like you just fine when you're not around. Um, whenever I was at a book place. Uh, and somebody like a woman would pick it up and she'd go, <laughs> that's my husband. And she'd laugh. And huh. then a man would pick it up and he'd go, <laughs> I bet my wife would say that about me. Like I could bet money on it. Um, and it always made people laugh. And immediately they would say something like, that's my mother or my brother is just that way or something like that. So um, you want people to get interested in it in a way that, opens the door to them. Having said that, um, my first two books, they changed the titles of them. So, uh, mm. you know, you never know if you're going to be yeah. able to get your title, but you don't care about that as much as you care about getting an agent happy about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So we've got the, the, the treatment here. Oh, Samantha asked, what's a friend com, which you kind of explained, but um, basically the idea is a rom-com, romantic comedy, but instead of a romantic pairing it's a friend pairing right um and um and then just to clarify uh sonia i think asked a question about uh just you're really just focusing on the a plot and not the b plot yeah. or the subplot yes yeah yep. um, yeah so then here we we looked at this but again this then what is this explain this one to us because so no. this one is the, so um, when your book gets announced that it's been sold, it gets put into publisher's marketplace and your agent and you, or sometimes your editor will help write a tiny little treatment, like a tiny little not, um, you know, uh, thing that, that gets published in Publishers Weekly about what happened. And so, uh, so they said, you know, they, they, the founder of the Tall Poppy Writers, I thought you said this would work, pitched, and then the the treatment or the log line and then Chris Werner at Lake Union Publishing in a preempt meaning they they bought it they didn't want anybody else to see it they wanted to buy it right away 
they didn't want us to submit it to anyone else. So in case they lost it. And so we sold it to them without sending it to anyone else or pitching it to anyone else. And Rachel Ekstrom is my agent at Folio Lit Agency um, and they have world rights. So that's what all that is. And now it's in Publishers Marketplace. So they publish that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to sort of, because Maggie did ask a question about the longer spine, this longer synopsis, which yours, you sent me yours for, um, for I was it for this book? Or no, it was for, um, well, I think I said to yeah, me. for this yeah. book. And it was, it was 2000 words. Oh, was it? And, okay. and it kind of just goes through like this outline again, you know, we're not necessarily being a proponent of any specific outline. Um, but like, you know, this sort of thing where she kind of, Anne in hers literally went through and gave these headings and had a paragraph under each of these headings. And it ended up being about 2000 words for that longer synopsis. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then I just kept, I just used this as a spine. I mean, it doesn't, and again, like I, I, people really like to have a formula. This is not a formula. Right. Uh, it's just, it's a, like when people say, what's your process? This is my process. If I try to make it a formula, it wouldn't work. It is a living document that gets changed as I write the book. I go in and fix it. I go out and write. I go in and fix it just for my own sake to make sure it makes sense and it's going forward in a reasonable way. Um, you know, some people put it on whiteboard. Some people put it in Scrivener. Some people put it all over the walls. This is the way that I think I've learned that works the best for me. And it's really because I've studied stories so hard. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it comes to me to do it this way. So the value of... Um... And again, this might be something that you save uh, until you sort of get a go ahead from someone to say like, yeah, this premise sounds really cool. Um, so you don't, we're not even necessarily saying in your five treatments, come up with an extended outline for all of them. You're just looking at what's a short synopsis, what's a log line, what's a, what's a comp for it. And the whole logic here is even if you don't have an agent like Anne had where you could send it to that agent and say, choose one of these, you could still do these with, you know, you could spend, some people have a writing group where they're taking chapters and you might find that one or two or three sessions might be better spent going over these. Like maybe instead of mm -hmm. 20 pages of a chapter, uh, you, you give them five separate treatments and you say, okay, let's talk about these and rank them and, and see how people are responding, right? Well, and one of the things that we didn't say, and I saw one of the questions over here, um, somebody said, well, would I send all these ideas to an agent to try to get an agent? You would not do that. No. Um, you only want the one thing that you're excited about. But what you could do and what I would suggest you do is you get a writing group and you do it with the writing group. And you 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 say, which one do you like and what's a good story and what do you but you have to not be defensive about it. You have to be like, these are my ideas. I wrote them this way. What do you think in general? And then you have to allow them to ask you questions and try not to get frustrated. Um, but hopefully you have um, or you've met a group of people that don't frustrate you um, and you can work together with them, even if it's just one person. Um, because uh, having like I will read all of them to my friends and I will read them to my daughter, which she hates. And um, unless she's in it. But uh, I but I really need to have that back and forth because if somebody says, yeah, I, I just don't think I would read a book like that. If I have two other people say they would, then I can kind of go forward and think mm -hmm. oh, I would too. Um, so we're suggesting it as an exercise. We're suggesting it as a point of bouncing off. There's no magic five. It could be two. It could be, right. three, it could be 10. It doesn't matter. I, I just, keep writing them and sticking them in a file. Um, and and sometimes I look at them and I'm like, that was crap. And I redo it and then it becomes something. But sometimes it's pretty rough at first and then it doesn't get fleshed out until the very end of the book. Eventually. Right, right. It's a process. I, I mean, I hate, it's like, it's just, it's a technique that seems to work because I understand what story is and what classic story structure is and how important character is, and which is what we're going to talk about. Right. You know, as right. We go forward on these little classes here. 
Yeah, and so, and and just to clarify too, like, yeah, and you kind of address this, but th this really, unfortunately, for most agents, yes, they want a full manuscript. So we're not saying do this instead of a full manuscript and find an agent this way. But to I've seen so many people who have invested a year or two writing a book and without really assessing like, is this premise something people are really gonna like? Mm -hmm. Is this prem like, you know, and so you just sort of hope after two years that an agent will like it. And, you know, not that, not that it's that way for everyone. I mean, you you know, there's been some testing out with 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 various writing groups and classes and stuff like that. So people have given it feedback along the way. But but it's sort of it's somewhere in between. Um, and uh, Kavid over here mentions the manuscript wish list, which I love those. I love seeing like what are agents looking for and sort of perusing those. But a lot of times I'm hesitant to say, okay, I'm going to do that book because. All right. Two years later, I breathlessly show up. Here's what you wanted, you know. Yeah. And do they still have that wish list with for the same things, or has, yeah. uh, you know, has everyone already written their vampire novel by then? And I yeah. no longer can do that. So you know, it's somewhere in between that. It's sort of um, looking at some ideas that you have, testing them out on people, and uh, knowing with a little bit more confidence that okay, I think I can. I think this one resonated with people and I think I can invest my time and energy in writing this story. Right. And if it's the book that you know that you want to write and it's the only one that you want to write, approaching it this way is also a good idea just because it gives you a cheat sheet to write your book, which is how I use it. I use it as a cheat sheet. Like I'm working on another book right now and I wrote a very long treatment and while I got to a certain part, I was like, what did I do? What did I, was I thinking about that? And I went back into my thing and I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was a little spare there. I needed to add a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, it's a way to organize your thoughts. And I think writers are always looking for ways to organize their thoughts because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So here, um, Tim and I were talking about, um, you know, what we thought that people might like to see. And um, building out the ideas so that you can write. So there's some stages that you have to go to. Like, I'm assuming everybody's going to go sit down and try to write a treatment. And then you will die and be embarrassed and cry and go, I can't do it and be mad at us. So we thought the second class should be, how do you build out an idea from a premise? Like, I think it would be really fun for you to listen to Tim and Ard's ideas about building out an idea. And we can use I like it just fine when you're not around because that's been published. I'm not giving anything away. And we talked a little bit about how I built out that story and, and really in such a ridiculous way in some ways. Mm -hmm. And then we decided, we thought another thing that people really need to understand is how that character helps you build out your story. And then how to understand story structure in a way that really allows you to follow it, but then also you know, leave it, but always come back to it. Because we know people like stories told in a certain way. That's why all the movies have a midpoint reversal. That's why we all know there's a climax and there's a wrap up at the end. So we know that. So why not learn it? Right. Um, and then after you do those three things, that's when you start to write the pitch in a way that might be a pitch. Like the front part is like, looks like garbage and then you start to make it pitch worthy like what, what you saw of mine i didn't just sit down and write that i had all the garbage first in my head mm -hmm. after that we could talk about log lines after that we could talk about comps and then i think we don't have this on here tim but we should talk about agents and maybe mm -hmm. we can bring in a couple of agents we, yeah. I, I know we can they would yeah. love to i know two that would love to do it that'd be great yeah, yeah. In fact, I need to write to one right now. I just realized. But yeah. All right. Yeah. Write and write yourself a note there. And I'll add that too. Um, yeah. So, the so you know, we're kind of seeing, we wanted to see today if if this was something people are interested in, because I think we could do these follow-up sessions. And again, it would remain sort of super casual like this, but, you know, not, uh, not thoughtless, because Anne and I are both coming from uh, backgrounds, extensive backgrounds of as writers and as teachers of writing. Um, and so, you know, so it's not just that we're 
waking up and stumbling out of bed to the uh, to the camera here. But yeah, so you know, gauge we'll gauge the interest and see if it's out there and it's something we'd love to to do because I think we're both passionate about it. But um, mm -hmm. see if it's something people would be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, bring a few questions. We'll have a, a little bit time of, for Q and A, uh, and and then we'll wrap up maybe in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, the inside outline, Jenny Nash. Yeah, it's it's somewhat similar to that in that it's constantly thinking about um, how the character is driving the plot forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is that what she calls it, inside outline? Yeah, she calls yeah. it that now, and it used to be. Um, they used to have some other name, which I forget now, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, please, to the follow-ups. Yeah, other questions you guys have on the stuff we've gone over or any questions that I missed in the uh, scroll here? This, I think, is kind of a setup. <laughs> it took an hour to set up because I feel like what we're doing here is trying to convince you that we think this is a good idea. Right. Even though it's it's sort of a formidable thing. Like I think most people are like, I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna start writing a book, and that's exciting for them. They want to keep going. And then what happens is they get a little ways and they're like, I, I don't know what to do next. Like I don't yeah. know what to do next. And and that's a really hard place to be. So we're trying to get people to think about, you know, we, we want more people to finish and finish well. So that they don't have to take it apart, throw it away, and start all over again. Yeah, Marty asks, "How do you get an agent? How do you know you're ready for an agent? How do you evaluate your agent? If the agent likes your treatment, then what happens?" Um, yeah, we could. That's there's a lot there, and that maybe so much there. I want to answer every question. I know, right? That's a lot. That's a lot, and and I think we should have a whole couple of things on agents. I'd love to have a whole couple. One can be us talking, another we can bring some agents in. And yeah, and we were even thinking about maybe having a contest where you've got your stuff in front of agents. I mean, that's yeah. something that we can definitely do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, putting this out here, we we want to really we want to keep doing these for free, um, and uh, and give these other classes for free. Um, if you can afford it, I know we're not, we're really not trying to milk you guys for money. This isn't going to be a big, um, you know, money making endeavor. But if it's something, if you're so inclined, you can afford it, um, then you can send us a little tip. Um, and I have two links here. And uh, those will be, you know, going to both me and Anne, um, not just to me. Um, so if you if you tip us, it goes to both of us. Um, and then, and or you can buy Anne's book, I Like You Just Fine When You're Not Around. There's a link for that in the description on the YouTube video. This is recorded. Um, and I think in the link, I also put down um, uh, the, or the description, I also put down the link to my PayPal donation. Um, so I think those should be working now, but um, I'll double check those there, Samantha. So yeah, so links down in the script description for both of those. You might need to do a show more on the description. Um, and Venmo, of course, if you guys have that. Um, if you have other follow-up questions that you can think of after this, just go ahead and email me um, or Anne. If you, if um, I'll try to put, actually, Anne, you want to tell them, do you have an email that you're, or should I just forward theirs to you uh, if you get them? Either way, we could do it. Why don't you just forward it? Because I yeah. would probably pass in my G Gmail and that one's long. So um, okay. forward it and that'll be, yeah. I'll get it. So td at stormwritingschool.com. Um, you can send me follow up questions if you'd like and let me know anything else that you have out there. Um, and uh, yeah, and so newsletter stuff. Um, if, uh, if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, uh, the link is in the description below, I believe. That's just blogstormwritingschool.com slash subscribe. Um, Anne has this much fancier texting um, sign up here for hers. Um, what you do is you get out your phone and you text to the number 66866 mm -hmm. and you type the message tall poppy. Mm -hmm. And, and then you've got a free nutrition book. And the reason I, I, it's a free nutrition book for anybody, but I think writers need it particularly because we sit so much. And um, I was a nutrition professor for years. So I created a small how-to about eating in the most uh, reasonable way, funny, uh, funny way possible. But 
Um, and it comes straight to your phone if you have a Dropbox. So that's one way. But the other thing is you could go to angarvin.net and you can sign up for my email there. And that would be great because we will send out um, messages for new classes and you'll get all Tau Poppy news. And you always get one essay from me once a month um, that I write for the for the probably a lot of you already are joined. But just so you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sonia, the, the synopsis is very, very similar to what you'd say if you were pitching directly to an agent at a conference. Um, I thought the synopsis and summary were one and the same. Thanks for clarifying. Um, yeah, anything to add to that, Anne? Because you've sort of overseen people pitching to agents directly. Yeah, you know, um, I the it's all it's sort of all the same. Um, sometimes when you're doing it verbally, it it looks a little bit differently. And I I don't never know what to call it. Synopsis, summary, treatment, nut graph. Like there's all these different ways to call it. It's all the same thing. And the best way that I describe it is whatever they would put on the back of a book. Um, and the back of the book is supposed to bring readers in. So the back of your book thought. Are bringing an agent in, so, mm -hmm. so you can do that verbally. Sometimes you can do it um, through email. It should be about the same. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Did I make? Did I answer that question? So, yeah, Sonia. Um, timing. Really are, really are. More. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know. I've heard lots of different ways that people talk about it, and I don't know that there's one word. Pitch is how they usually do it. Right. Right. Yeah. A lot of this language is thrown around in in slightly different definitions, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the yes, you'll be able to see this again, Lloyd. Uh, this will be recorded, um, and so you can just come back to this YouTube channel. I don't know if it has to, you know, um, do some some processing of that before it, it's live. But uh, this same link should bring you back here, or just bookmark my page and come to the live videos. Um, can you please talk about tension? Tension. I mean, there's some tension that's inherent in. Um, kind of the overview of conflicts in the short synopsis, but then tension is really tension really lives in the scenes, right? So yeah, it does. Tension lives, and you know that's another thing we can do. It's one on scene. Um, it just doesn't usually fit with. I mean, maybe if we start doing craft talks, it fits a little bit better there. But yeah. I mean, tension is essentially stakes and conflict. So whatever I want, you're gonna take it away. So we can, and I think one of the things that people get mixed up on, and they'll say, you know, they'll just put in a drug heist. But if I, you know, if if I don't go out, then the drug heist is not a big deal for me, right? So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we want to make sure that whatever it is that you're you're creating in terms of conflict, it has to fit your protagonist's fears, or knock them off their beam. It can't just be a flood if they're not worried about drowning. Like if they're excellent swimmers, you're not going to throw a flood at somebody. Mm -hmm. You're you're only going to throw a flood at somebody if they are, have a water phobia and they can't swim and they need to get to the other side of the pool to save their child. Because if you put fire there, the person's like, I don't care. I'll go through fire. But if you put water there and the person has all these phobias, that's the right thing to put there. Mm -hmm. And so you do that, you even do that in your in your query, right? In your pitch or your summary. Like two women who should be best friends are not best friends anymore, but to save their best friend, their actual best friend, they gotta go do something they don't want to do. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And and I like Sonia, your follow-up here. You've had agents ask for a summary where they wanted the ending. Absolutely. Like a lot of times a query letter you're giving away the whole story. You're spoiling it, right? And but this work that we're sort of that Anne is talking about here with the short synopsis, this log line, and these comps isn't really doing that because it's so front loaded. You maybe don't know exactly how the story is ending uh, by the time you write those things, but you do know like the premise and what's kicking this off and what's the basic, you know, what's the launch point and the trajectory for the story. Um, so it's true, yeah. What we're what we're talking about with the short synopsis definitely doesn't give away the ending. It leaves it sort of mysterious. It's it's like the as Anne was saying, you look at the back of any book, and the the description you're getting, oops, uh, the description you're getting on the back of any book is going to not give it away. It's going to sort of draw you in. So that's what we're looking at here. 
Yeah, I want to say one more thing is that I can tell by someone's synopsis where the diagnostic for your book. Like I can read somebody's summary and go, like, this makes no sense. This makes no sense because this, I don't know what yeah. they want. I don't know what's in their way. Like I can talk somebody through their entire novel by working on that beginning paragraph. And then once I do that, they go, oh, the novel's got to change now. And then they, and that's exactly what happens. Whenever I go to the pitching conference in New York and do it, I have 19 people that are telling me what their summary is. And I'm, you know, in 15 of them, I'm saying, you got to rewrite that book. That makes no sense. And they go, oh, and it's not because they followed. It's because they didn't follow what the character wanted. They didn't put the right conflicts in and they didn't use classic storytelling structure. So we are telling you to do that first so that you don't end up at a pitch conference where somebody says, rewrite it, mm -hmm. which is what happened. Right, right. So that, I think in a nutshell, that's why we're pushing for this. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, Trisha, have you guys heard much about whether now is a good time or not uh, such a good time to query? Jane Friedman talked a little bit about that in her most recent hot sheet newsletter, which is like a paid mm -hmm. for subscription newsletter. And she talked to several people in the industry and the consensus was, we don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. It was pretty much people saying like, well, uh, here are the reasons it might be, and yet here are the reasons it might not be. And uh, so far we can't really say. Some people are saying, yeah, everyone should do this, but kind of because everyone's saying everyone should do this, they're getting inundated with submissions. So, so it, it's hard to say, that's what I've heard. It's really hard to say. And, um, and I can tell you this, I, my I agent is super busy. I wrote to her a few things and she didn't get back to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's been a week now, a week and a half. So she's busy and um, that's just to say they're working hard. But right. they're also probably just as distracted as all of us. Right. You know, it's a hard time. I read that that one. I tweeted this the other day, and it wasn't my quote. And I loved it. You, you're not working from home. You've been sent home to work in a crisis. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think we all are sort of feeling that way a little bit. Yeah, right. I, I definitely am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, again, the recording will be available to everyone so you can look back at this and um, email me if you have follow-up questions my email is right there on the screen um, and uh, again if you can afford you know just a couple dollars five a couple three dollars as we say in wisconsin sometimes um five dollars ten fifteen twenty whatever um then uh, we'd be grateful and um then it would allow us to um put some time into this uh amidst the other chaos that we have going on so um yeah We'll be thinking about when to do the next one. Uh, Tim and I were kind of talking about maybe doing them weekly on Wednesdays at this time. Mm -hmm. We can kind of talk about that and see what works for people. Right. We'll sort of feel that out and, and um, yeah, and we'll keep in touch. So subscribe to those newsletters and you'll get some announcements on those. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anne. And yeah, um, thank you. yeah we'll see you guys and uh, hear from you later. Okay, so fun. Thanks so much, you guys. All right. Bye.